It's interesting. We're in the month of remember, and you know, a, a, a celebration comes along like Mother's Day, and of course, we're going to think about our mothers and our grandmothers and mother, the mother influences in our lives. In, in a religious science um, vein, we think about the mother of creativity, that, that thing in us that's always creating, always nurturing us, always taking care of us. Um, and we think about the, the, the starting point. You know, I grew up in, a, in an extremely, in an extremely conservative, very conservative, uh, strict Catholic family. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, wow, a lot of you. Yeah, Joe, boy, you almost threw your arm out of socket with that arm going up. Um, so my father was a cop. My grandfather, his father, was a fire chief, fire chief, battalion chief. Um, it was extremely authoritarian the way we grew up. Everything was yes, sir, no, sir. May I leave the dinner table? You know, and God forbid you left beets on the, on, the, on the dish. Anybody with beets? Anybody ever have to sit? Yeah. I love beets now, somehow. I don't know how that happened, but literally beets was like, was like throw up to me. It was like, <laughs> ugh. You know, I don't know anybody else, but if someone has a problem with vomit, I, I join them just out of sympathy. Um, so you put beets on the table, and my mother loved beets, so we'd always get them, and I would have to sit there at the table till I finished the beat. Sometimes nine, ten o'clock. I'd still be sitting at the table like, it's not happening. And I was, I was really a renegade. But you'd, I'd still have to eat my beets because I ended up eating them. And then just like, do you ever try to eat something you don't like and you just keep eating it and leaving it in your mouth? And it just stays there? This is a fun talk, isn't it? <laughs> I'll enjoy it. Um, so the title of my talk today, I just want you to know the kind of life I had. But I grew up in a very authoritarian, and it's so funny because when, when I became a father, I was like, I, I will not raise my children this way. My son, they will never say yes, sir, and no, sir to me. They do not have to eat beets at the table. They do not have to finish their food. You know, and I went the opposite direction and then realized I needed to come back to a nice middle ground. You know, I remember the day, oh, I wasn't going to talk about this. I remember the day I said to my son, because he was really pissing me off, and I said, you know what? You know what we're going to start? You're going to start saying yes, sir, and no, sir to me. And you know what he did? He laughed. <laughs> he literally laughed. He went, Dad, really? I was like, yes. I want yes, sir, and no, sir. And he was like, oh, yes, sir. And I was like, anyway, it didn't work. So the title of my talk is Grandma Understands. And um, I have a little story about that. So... Grandma, which we called Mum Mum, Mum Mum. My father and mother grew up on the same street. They grew up in downtown Philadelphia, right behind the art museum. Rocky's Stairs was literally where we played as children. And it was, they lived right behind Rocky's Stairs, right by the Schuylkill uh, River. And my mom lived at 2128 Spring Street, and my father lived at 2121 Spring Street. And so they grew up together. And so I had two grandmothers and two grandfathers on the same street. So it was very difficult to go visit one of them and not go to see the other. And as most of you know, when a man marries a woman, the woman's family takes over. Anybody realize that? Who else has that in their family? And my, my, fa my brother proved it when he got married too. So, you know, the mother's family really gets precedent. So we were always at my mother's family, but I really resonated with my mum mum. So I would always sneak out and go down to Mum Mum's. So one Sunday, we're having this big dinner, and, and, and she was Mum Mum, and she was Nen Nen. And I wondered if we could talk talk back then, <laughs> because that's how we had names. There was Bami and Brub Brub, and it was like, who are you? Um, yes, but I was Jimmy. Jimmy was fine. Um, so one night, I snuck down to Mum Mum's house, and she was watching some TV show. And I, I decided I wanted to um, play. So my grandmother got me a big quilt that she had made, that she had crocheted or knitted something, and, and then got me a, a tiara. You see where this is going, don't you? She got me this tiara, and I put the robe around me, and I was doing a show for my grandmother and my, my uncle. And I'm doing this, and my father walks in looking for me. And I am literally like in the middle of a drag show 
at, at like six, and I'm standing on a, one of those little poofters. I'm like standing on it, and I'm like, I'm, I've got the, the tiara, my grandmother's tiara, and the, and the robe, and I'm doing this thing. He walked in, and he's like, what the hell is going on here? And my grandmother was like, sit down. Well, that's his mother. So he sat down. And I was like, I love you. And she said, go ahead, Jimmy. And they had music playing, and I'm dancing around the living room and doing my thing. My father couldn't say anything about it. But then we had to do the walk from that house to my <laughs> grandmother's house. And my father's like, what were you doing? And looking back on that, actually what he said was, please don't tell your mother about this, um, which I didn't. And, and anybody that saw my, sh I'm not going there. Uh, <laughs> when I look back, I see a grandmother who understood me. I see a woman who, in the midst of an authoritarian household, with a really, my, my grandfather was like mean as dirt. He was this fire chief. And I can look and see why my father was so strict, because he came from a very strict father. Very strict father. And, God, and my grandfather, Grandpa Mellon, he was like five foot six. So he was just angry, because he was so short. <laughs> No, my father wasn't. My father was six foot. So growing up, I realized that my grandmother was extraordinarily responsible for helping me know who I am. Um, fast forward, as my life continued, I went to uh, my mother. It was a beautiful woman. My mother was a fashion model. She was gorgeous. She looked like Elizabeth Taylor. And, um, and we had a very close relationship until I started to really reach out and become myself. And then she was having a hard time with it. She was having a very hard time with my extravagant idea of myself. I mean, I remember when I came home from the, from the store with my mum mum buying jeans, and I came home with red, flashy, fire engine jeans. And she was like, you are not wearing those outside. I was like, yes, I am. And I, I wore them everywhere. I, I think I wore them into the ground. Um, and my mother didn't, she had a hard time with my, my, my talents singing and dancing. I literally, I was like a grasshopper. I would tap dance. I didn't know how to tap dance, but I would tap dance all over the house, and I would dance all over the house and jump from, you know, I would jump from a, from a couch in the air, pose, and then land in a tumble. And, you know, my mother would just be, stop! She drove her crazy. Well, once she was uh, dealing with me, <laughs> I had done something horrible, and I was in my young teenage years at this point, and she forbid me to leave the house. I was grounded. And my aunt, who was really the mother figure to me, her sister, who raised me really, came in and said, he's going. He has a show to do tonight. I was singing that night. And she goes, and my mother was like, oh, like that, like that matters. Who cares? She goes, he's grounded. And so my aunt Carolyn came to me and she just said, Jimmy, go get your things and leave. I was like, I can't leave. I'm grounded. She goes, leave. And I did. And my mother was furious. And then my aunt made her go with her down to see the show at Consolation, Our Lady of Consolation's <laughs> Basement <laughs> School, where I was singing Bridge Over Troubled Waters, which was the theme of my life. <laughs> and uh, as my aunt tells me, I started to... <laughs> I started to sing, and my mother had never heard me sing, really. I started to sing, because I'd done a talent show, and I already told you that story where I was so horrible, it was embarrassing for her. But my voice had changed. And so I started to sing Bridge Over Troubled Waters, and my mother burst into tears. She was just, she had no idea I could sing that way. And it changed everything between her and I, except that she died two years later of cancer. Um, but that day, that day of... You're grounded, but you must go. This is the rule, and you need to break it to be who you need to be. That was a huge lesson for me. And as anybody who knows me, and you're all getting to know me very well now, um, I break rules when I think a rule needs to be broken to do what's right. Um, so I believe that. So today's talk is really more about the the science of mind, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> if you give me the next slide. So foundations. Obviously, my mother and my grandmother were incredible foundations of my life. 
My grandmother said to me, be who you are, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, including your freaking father, who I raised, by the way, my grandmother would say. So I've got this. I've got you. Ernest Holmes says, I live in the faith that there is a presence and a power greater than I am that nurtures and supports me in ways I could not even imagine. So as we celebrate Mother's Day, Ernest Holmes is asking us to celebrate it all the time. Celebrate that there is this energy, this mother energy that says, I got you. I have you. I will hold you. I will hold the real you. Now go be it. I'm here. Go do it. That's the foundation of our teaching. This quote is the foundation of our teaching. This quote is the mother of our, foundation, of, of our teaching. That there is that loving presence inside of you that has you at all times, as most of us felt about our mothers or grandmothers or whoever it is you feel that way about. So that's number one, foundations. But once you... Once you live in the faith that there's this presence, things happen, things come along and change your perspective. So yeah, we can teach you the foundations of the science of mind and you can understand it and you can learn it and you can come here and take classes with Reverend Dale and Reverend Laurie um, and myself and Dr. Laura. You can come here and learn everything there is to learn about the science of mind, but unless you are willing to live it, it's just information. I lived it on that, 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 I want to say poofter seat, but I don't think that's what it's called. <laughs> that, that thing jumping up and down with a calf, with a, um, a, a, thank you. I thought it was a robe, but it was really a blanket. A blanket around me and a tiara, uh, which is so great, which is why I didn't t- mention it that time when I won the tiara here, but then I didn't win the tiara. I was like, wow, that's so funny. I got it last time. But then my practitioner in, in Los Angeles, came to church, and when he came to church, he gave me a tiara as part, of, as part of the gift on stage in front of the congregation. He said, I heard about your tiara fa- fiasco in Palm Desert. I'm giving you a new one. <laughs> no, very nice. So, so all of these, these were, these were the foundational aspects of my life. I should get to be who I want to be, who I feel. I'm, at seven years old, you're not thinking gay, straight, feminine, masculine. You're just dancing to the rhythm that's coming through you, period. But the problem is the people. The problem is people. (laughs) The problem is the people come along and tell you that's not how boys act. That's not appropriate for girls. This is what you need to do. And we start to listen. And so experience starts to change the foundational truth of who we are. So you can come here and learn foundations and what this teaching is all about and what the philosophy that we teach is all about, but then life is going to tell you other things and show you other things. And that's where my Aunt Carolyn came into play because you know, having a cop father and, a, a cop, and then my brother became a cop, all my brothers have become cops except me, um, and, the gra- and the fireman grandfather and the, the authoritarian world I live in, and then the other grandfather who I don't mention much because he was literally diabolical. He was crazy. He really was crazy. He, he ran for senator. <laughs> there you have it. Uh, yeah. But he was just mean. This is a guy that put me on a, a refrigerator when I was like four or five, sat me on a refrigerator, and then stood back to watch me cry. And, and his brother, his son, my uncle, they both just watched me because they thought it was funny. I forgive them. Love only, forgive everything. Right. So in that household, it's easy, in, that li- in your life, it's easy to let other things affect what you absolutely know. That's what this center is all about, teaching us that, yes, it's one thing to know it, it's another thing to live it. And this next slide, experiential. Sometimes, this is my Aunt Carolyn who said this, sometimes you have to break the rules to do what's right. Sometimes you do. This man knew that. And by the way, when I say break the rules to do what's right, I'm not talking about anger. I'm not talking about violence. I'm not talking about breaking rules that are important to hold, to uphold. But sometimes there's a bigger right in place. I think we're on the precipice of that right now in this country, watching our world change and shift. 
And there will come a time when every one of us is going to have our voice heard. We need to be heard. And we have to do, we have to speak our truth in the face of whatever is going on. Whichever side you are on, by the way. Because I don't get, I don't play that game of this is the only right side. So the experiential. So your life is going to be filled with experiences like Christine and I both share, you know, having lost a child. Um, that's a big experience. You know, my, my, I, I see a grief counselor to deal with this, and my, my d- counselor said to me on Monday, he said, you know, James, you had this idyllic life. You have an incredibly handsome, successful, loving husband who would go to the ends of the earth for you, and you feel the same way. You had two gorgeous children, both of them so freaking talented, they put you and Kevin a little bit to shame. I was like, you're going a little far here, but go ahead. Uh, <laughs> And he's, he's telling me, he goes, and you lived this idyllic life. You know, you have this incredible church. Now you have two beautiful congregations. He said, you had this idyllic life, and then your daughter died. And you no longer had it. He said, and you will never have it again. Because that changed. The question becomes, and I know you all relate to this in some way, whatever happened to you experientially, who do you become now? Do you let that turn you into someone? Or do you stay truthful to who you know yourself to be? You're this little four-year-old jumping up and down with a, a, a cape on and a tiara. Do you stay there? Do you let that keep growing? Or do you let that change who you are? And that's the second part of our teaching, the experiential. Can you live life to the fullest and no matter what happens, still allow yourself? to know the truth of who you are. So my job almost every day is to ask myself, what is affecting my beliefs? What's affecting my beliefs? Because my beliefs are running the show. If I believed that Nora's passing was the end of my life, my life would have ended. This would have never happened because I wouldn't have been open to it. Nothing. It would have been done then. Any of anything that's gone on in your life, any aspect of it. I saw somebody was sweeping up outside today, and, and I, a young man, and I thought to myself, and I know Elizabeth knows who this is, um, Mauricio's son. Mauricio? Okay. And I thought to myself, has anyone told him that he can be anything he wants to be in his life and do anything he wants to do, no matter what? And I've seen some, of, some other people in the world, and I'm like, has anyone told you how great you are? Has anyone reminded you that you are the living presence of this energy. But I have to ask myself that too. Do I have beliefs in place because someone told me something else, something different? This idea, when we celebrate Mother's Day, Grandmother's Day, when we celebrate that which gave us birth, the greatest thing we could ever do is understand that once birth is given, it's up to us to take that birth and make something out of it. And then we become a reflection of who that mother was. And, you know, my aunt, I spoke to her this week. She has Alzheimer's now. And and it's pretty painful. It's pretty painful to experience that. And so when I was on the phone with her, which I finally got her on the phone after like six months of not being able to get her on the phone, um, she knew who I was right away. And um, I started asking her, I thought, I'm going to ask her questions about the past. I think her, she knew everything about the past. I asked her about the time that I almost burnt the house down because I liked candles. And I said, do you remember that time that I kind of burnt my mom's bed? I put a candle on the bed and I didn't realize it caught fire. That's what you want to do in a, in a fire chief's house. <laughs> Burn down the bed. And she was like, oh my God, Jimmy, do you remember that? And then your Uncle Eddie came in and I had to tear him off of you because he was so angry at you. I was like, she remembered all of that, you know? And, um, and it was beautiful. And, but she's the one that taught me to be a renegade. So the, the question becomes, how much of life are we going to blame on the past? And by the way, if anyone's sitting here thinking, oh, it's Mother's Day and I have such a horrible relationship with my mother, that's okay. It's okay. But at some point, you need to forgive her, no matter what she did. We need forgive everything to free yourself up to be able to live the life you want to live. Because the third part of today's message, between here's the foundations, here's the experience, 
And the third part, if you'll give me this next slide, is choice. Ernest Holmes says, life is a mirror, and we reflect back to the thinker what he thinks into it. It doesn't say, life is a mirror, and we'll reflect back to you whatever your mother said was true. No. It says, guess what? You're not your mother anymore. Let her off the hook and move on, Blanche. <laughs> That's Blanche from the Golden Girls, of course. So... In the end, I think we all must realize that we are the mothers to ourselves. There comes a point where we start having to make the decisions on our own. Um, there's a great quote that came out this morning, Rick Tamlin, who many of you know. Uh, I get an email from him every Sunday morning, and this is the quote that came into my email this morning. What impact will this have on the world? And... My question to you today is this. Um, what impact will your mother have on this world through you? What impact will your father or your grandmother? What impact will anything have on this world through you? Because guess what? At this point, every single one of us, we are the ones making the impact. Yes, we get to look back and see the the foundations of our lives. I am so grateful to Mama Mellon for letting me be who I was. And I'm grateful for all the experiences I've had. I'm grateful, as I said, I was watching Nora sing right before I came out here. I'm grateful that I had 19 years with her. So that's what I can look at. There's my experiential. And I'm a choice. You're a choice. You're a choice here today. You're a choice to live a life that is astounding, you're a choice to live a life beyond anything you could ever imagine, Pat. At this age, at this time in your 75-year marriage, I know it's not that long, <laughs> but it's long. How many years are you married? Not married, together. 40, 40 years, okay. And who's, who's longer? How many years? 40. 42. 57. 57. Do I have a 58? <laughs> Anybody married for 58 years? Okay, so... You can have whatever you choose to have with whoever you choose to have it with. You are not bound by anything that has come before, but there's a foundation that has been laid. And if you don't like that foundation, then you do need to show up in this class, in this room, when we go over foundations. So you get what the foundation of this teaching is, and then you need to spend the time to look at all the things that have happened in your life that have impacted what you actually know weed them out, and then make the choice to impact this world in the way you want to impact it. And I know that I, I impact the world based on the way my mother raised me, the way my Aunt Carolyn raised me, the way my grandmother raised me. I know that I impact this world the way my husband has related to me for 33 years the way my children have impacted my life. It all impacts life. But it doesn't change the truth of who you are. Nothing changes the truth of who you are if you're willing to allow the truth of who you are to run the show. And the truth of who you are is that you are that mother energy, that creative energy, that at any moment is ready to create a new, a new beginning, a brand new experience of life. It's all up to you and your mother. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs>